Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 8th, 2022 meeting of the Policy and Services Committee, our first meeting of the year. And we got a slightly new lineup, which is exciting. So welcome, Councilmember Cormack. Uh, hello, Councilmember Tanaka and everyone else from staff and, and the public joining us. Um, let's let's start with, with public comments. So clerk, can you, um, can you open up public comment, please? Chair Stone, I think perhaps you might want to call oh, roll call first. The roll. There we go. Yes. Thank you. I knew there was going to be one mistake, so I got it out of the way within the first 30 seconds. Okay. Um, Chair Stone? Here. Council Member Cormack? Here. Council Member Tanaka? Here. For the record, all present. Excellent. Now let's go to public comment. All right. Can we do uh, three minutes per public speaker, please? Okay. All right, Ken, you should be able to speak. Yeah, good evening. This is Ken Horowitz and I live uh, downtown on Homer Avenue. I've been a Palo Alto resident for 40 years. And I want to comment on your next council meeting regarding Coverly. Um, I used to teach at Foothill College. I still teach there part time. And I would ride down Middlefield to San Antonio and then go to the campus from there. And I always marveled what a jewel the Coverly site is. At your next council meeting, you're gonna be discussing a staff report regarding the Coverly concept and also about um, acquisition of some land. Um, I wanna say this nicely, but um, the Palo Alto Unified School District has been jacking around the uh, city council regarding their plans for the Coverly site. Initially, they were saving it for a third high school. That changed. They then were considering housing for teachers. That changed. And now they're, they wanted to put administrative offices there. That changed. And now they're going to look at it. The point I'm trying to raise is that we need a community center in Palo Alto, a first-class community center. And that Coverly site is ideal for a community center. And we can't keep letting the Palo Alto Unified School District keep di dictating their terms. And therefore, I hope at your meeting, and I'm speaking tonight because I'm not sure I can be at your council meeting next Monday, but I think it's important that you play hardball with Palo Alto Unified School District. I know you have a lease with them that runs till 2025, but they're not presenting any timetables for you, any kind of details about their plans, nor they're allowing you to acquise the eight acres. So please be careful and be diligent in your discussion next Monday night uh, regarding Palo Alto Unified School District. They have disappointed us so many times over the years regarding plans for the Coverly site. And as I said, we need a community center and we need to move forward and we can't allow the Unified School District to dictate the terms for a community center. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful meeting. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. <laughs> Aram um, James, you should be able to speak. Okay, I don't see the clock uh, set at three minutes. So maybe, can, okay, thank you very much. So uh, Chair Stone, uh, nice to see you this evening. Hope you're doing well, as well as the other members of the Policies and Services Committee. My friend, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Binder, I'm glad to see you tonight. Um, I would say that um, 
I was told I did. I very. I actually missed the the last speaker uh, last night, but I read a letter by Rebecca Eisenberg to the council that somebody came on and spoke and started spouting the N word during the course of that person's comments, uh, and nobody on the council, according to Rebecca, spoke back, complained, said this is ugly. Uh, I don't know what happened. So maybe somebody here can do that since race and equity is the subject matter tonight. Uh, I'm very concerned that Wayne Benitez is going to be a white man is going to be going on trial for uh, the attack on Gustavo Alvarez at, at Buena Vista. Uh, Nicholas Enberg was involved in the death of a, a young white man uh, on the Christmas night of 215. Shots fired at somebody with a butter knife resulting in his death. And we know about the canine attack where he was the handler. Then we have Thomas De Stefano. I don't know if he was fired or voluntarily left in the brutal, brutal, still pending civil suit of Julio Arvalo. What's common is all of the officers there were, uh, like myself, uh, either Jewish or Caucasian. Maybe all of them are Caucasian. Uh, but the, my question would be if we had recruited sufficient black officers that were partnered with these white officers, would they have intervened? And I believe the, the answer is that more likely than not, particularly if there had been training on that. So I'm very concerned because we've got um, a police chief who's not transparent. Uh, I believe that Andrew Binder is a person of transparency. Uh, I've had an opportunity to talk with him on many occasions. So I very feel very differently about our assistant chief than I do our chief. Maybe that comes as a surprise to some of you, but uh, uh, I'm hopeful that when we do uh, our recruitment for the new chief, that like we did in 2009, in which I pushed for in, in letters to the editor and Dave Price did and others, that we have a transparent search that we bring in the multiple uh, candidates for police chief and we the public and the press have a chance to interview them. So we don't have a repeat of somebody that I believe has been a tremendous scourge on our community and that's Chief Robert Johnson. Uh, so right now, uh, I hope that uh, we have a good meeting here tonight. I, I, I intend to speak again at le least once more um, and um, Let's talk about the RIPA and let's talk about RNS and uh, let's talk about the reparations uh, play. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Jennifer, you should be able to speak. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Stone and committee. It was encouraging to hear last night at your budget meeting how safety and leaf blower code enforcement priorities have clearly identified needs which I hope can happen soon with airplane noise. City staff did a great job on airplane noise in this committee in February 2015 and February 2018. Please now find a place on your agenda. February 28th would not be too soon. On Saturday, Council Member Phil Seth spoke about putting resources into the city's engagement with SFO, mentioning an inflection point with the rollout of GBAS and how we're not going to be in the San Mateo Roundtable anytime soon. Because council has previously committed to responding to airspace actions affecting Palo Alto, such as GBAS with respect to environmental review, I wonder if there is a plan to prioritize SFO engagement instead. It has happened with Pirate, the city chose to work locally and not challenge the FAA. However, I'd like to point out that the city's engagement of Palo Altans leading up to council's decision about Pirate was impeccable. Prior to council voting on Pirate, city staff documented citizens concerns to authorities, collected everything to inform council's deliberations, the public was heard in council chambers, and as much as I and many disagreed with council's final choice to send Pirate to the Santa Clara Roundtable, the public was given due process. GBAS impacts on Palo Alto neighborhoods are giant compared to Pirate. Pirate traffic volume is a quarter of each of Surfer and Bodega. The GBAS rollout in March involves all three paths. Yet thus far, city staff has only given a voice to SFO. It is within your power to take in the public's concerns before March. Please engage the people who will live with the outcome of these actions very directly. Please engage us on all your plans and as early as possible. Again, I 
don't think that February 28th would be too soon to schedule airplane noise on your agenda. Thank you very much and for all the work you do. Thank you, Ms. Landisman. Winter Dellenbach, you should be able to speak. Winter Dellenbach, uh, yes. Um, I wanna talk about uh, matrix in the matrix on the staff report uh, uh, H, uh, which is the use of force information report to the Ms. regular- Dellenbach, for, um, we're on oral communication right now. So for anything that's not on the agenda, but we're gonna be taking oh, the item I'm right so after this. Sorry, I jumped the gun again. That's, that's all right, you're just eager. I'm over enthusiastic. <laughs> I'm so glad to be back at Policy and Services. We're glad to have you. So in just a few moments, you're, you'll have your turn. Thank you though. Is there anything else that you'd like to speak that's off the agenda? Oh, so many things, but nothing to do with you folks. All right, well, thank you. We'll talk to you soon then. All right, that looked like it was the last one. All right, wonderful, thank you. And now then, We'll turn to our first action item, which is receiving an update on the recent race and equity work since September 2021, including an update on a records management system, contract for police data collection, and provide any recommendations on the city's race and, and equity work. And I, you know, I just, before we begin and jump, and jump into staff, I just, I just want to say, I, you know, I just kind of want to start by saying that last night's you know, ugly ignorant, racist, and, and truly just hateful remarks, um, and I'm glad Mr. James brought it up, really is a poignant reminder of how important this work is. And those, those comments are, are not who we are as a community, but the sad reality is that that hate continues to be a true scour scourge on our city and, and country. So I'm hoping we can have this discussion tonight in, in solidarity against hate and really continue to do the good work uh, on, on working to eliminating racism and, and bigotry in all its forms. So really the, the timing of tonight's item um, couldn't be any better. And with that, turn it over to you, Ms. Con Gaines. Thank you, Chair Stone, and um, congratulations on your role as chair. Uh, this evening, uh, oh, sorry, Chantel Cotton Gaines, Deputy City Manager. Uh, I have with me some other staff here as well where we can answer questions. This is our quarterly update on the race and equity efforts. The last update was actually in September, 2021. And we uh, pushed the discussion from December to this month for this uh, quarter, just because of timing of other items. So this one I think is a, a little bit delayed, but I wanted to make sure that we still brought it to the committee first thing this year. And we'll get back on the quarterly cycle. So. Uh, I'm going to high level, there's, there's a lot of information in this report, and instead of giving you all slides that have very, very small information, I'll just uh, summarize some of the high level things and we can dive deeper into the individual items. So I'll be referring to the staff report itself, uh, if that is okay with the committee. Okay. That's fine. Excellent. I will reference packet pages as well. Um, Actually, I'll just do a screen share, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Yes, please, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me know when you can see my screen. Everyone good? Okay, great. So I'll start with the, the high level. Um, City Council in November, 2020 gave staff 17 directives to follow. And as we referenced at the council retreat, we have completed 14 of those 17. So today I will give you the incremental few that we have completed, and then we'll go over the ones that we continue to work on, um, the ones we have completed since September. So those items include expediting the implementation of the new police records management system, or RIMS, you'll hear us refer to it as, with quarterly reports to the council, and return with the necessary agreements for the records management system, allowing for the Racial and Identity Profiling Act RIPA implementation. So we're very excited that as of December 1st, 2021, the new system went into place. And that system is in partnership with two of our neighboring jurisdictions, including the city of Mountain View and the city of Los Altos, I believe is the third city. And 
that system is so important because it's the foundation for our police department to really be able to comply with the racial and identity profiling act to have that updated information and not have a manual process for it the police department has been collecting the RIPA data and submitting to the Department of Justice since the implementation of the new system at the beginning of December. So that's a very huge lift. We'll have, uh, there's another item that we continue to work on related to RIMS, but in terms of the system implementation that has been completed. The next item is working with Santa Clara County on the implementation of the PERT program, also known as the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. And that program is where there is a licensed clinician working with a sworn officer here as a team in Palo Alto. And there's more details on that program within the report as well, but that's a huge lift. It's been many years in the making. And during the city council discussions in 2020, the city council emphasized that if the county was unable to uh, push forward this program and get it implemented, that we also work on a few alternatives. So pushing forward on all these things at one time, we have the PERT program implemented and we continue to work with the uh, county on their trust program, which is a similar program to the CAHOOTS program. And I apologize for everyone who listened to the retreat on Sunday, because this is the same information, but very important, or on Saturday. Um, so the CAHOOTS program is a program that does not involve a law enforcement officer, but it is focused on the mental health response as well. And the county's version of that program is called Trust. And we continue to be active with the county in uh, implementing the North County side of that. So lots of success there, but specifically in terms of implementing PERT, that item has been done. The last one is including the use of force information to the regular supplemental report submitted to the city council as a cover memo to each IPA report. This one, a lot has changed in 2021 related to the IPA's contract and therefore related to the report. So what we're used to as the supplemental cover memo report is actually shifted, uh, where most of that information is now included in the actual IPA report. But this recommendation in particular is emphasizing that we want the use of force information to be reported out on. So in the IPA report that was released last Thursday as an informational item for the city council on February 14th, included in that is a link to the use of force report covering the entire year of 2021, as well as the month of December of 2020. And the assistant chief vendor can give more details on specifics of that report if there are questions. So then I'll just scroll up to the items that we continue to work on the last three of 17. One is starting the full implementation after we have implemented RIMS, then going into the data collection period and doing the analysis of the data similar to our previous stop data reports. So we've implemented RIMS, we're collecting data for RIPA. This relates to the first report on the RIPA data, which will happen in 2023. So this item will stay on our list of things as we're preparing uh, everything that we can do in advance to be able to roll that report out as quickly as we can in 2023. Item K, returning in the fall of 2021, which is around now actually, with strategies prior to engaging with the Palo Alto police officers negotiations. So the city council and the city's negotiators through closed session meetings will continue to analyze and review any desired and required MOA changes that relate to the city's race and equity efforts. As of the writing of this memo, negotiations with POPOA over the successor agreement have not yet begun. So that'll be as we go along. And the last one is letter L, directing staff in coordination with the city's overall diversity and inclusion efforts to conduct a workforce demographic assessment as a baseline and to pursue an employee assessment to measure city workforce culture. So we are in uh, actively working on both of those, we issued an employee census to update the demographic information for individual employees, for people to share if they have um, any changes, ethnic, gender, et cetera, just to make sure that the information that we'll aggregately report out on is actually fresh information. And then also in terms of the employee assessment, we're in the process of putting together that assessment so we can roll it out hopefully in the first quarter of this year. That's a really big lift that staff has been uh, working on, and we're looking forward to making some good progress this quarter. And
and then I'm going to stop the share, but I will summarize things that are at the end of this report, which are other efforts happening at the city that are very important with continuing this conversation. In terms of the Human Relations Commission, they completed their 100 conversations on race and lived experiences in Palo Alto. And you received a report as a city council on January 24th about that effort and some of their findings. So that was a very huge lift and very grateful for the HRC for doing that work. The Palo Alto Art Center have had a few exhibits, the art of disability culture, uh, centering accessibility and creative attention, art and community restoration. So those things have recently occurred or will be occurring over the coming months. The Palo Alto Children's Theater have really focused on making sure that students and Palo Alto residents are able to see themselves reflected on the stage. So um, having different types of shows and factoring in multicultural influences into the casting. So one is Rahi Ray of Light as a show, factoring multicultural influences into the Snow Queen, as well as the Breath Project, the Reparations Project, um, and we can speak more about that if there are questions. The Palo Alto Public Art Program has started the Dr. King and Coretta Scott King Artist Residency Program. They are contracting with Reyes Magos as our first artist for the King Artist Res Residency. And his artwork will also um, involve community conversations to guide the actual art piece created for King Plaza. And then there's a long list of events that the library have engaged in, and I'll just reference some of the uh, ones that are more recent, which are the Lunar New Year story times and uh, the Lunar New Year event with Community Services Department as well, uh, Black History Month story times, as we're in Black History Month right now, and also um, updated blogs and reading lists related to different topics in this matter. So lots of efforts going on interdepartmentally at the city, making sure that we're implementing the items that the city council gave us as direction, as well as continuing the dialogue and conversation in the community. So with that, I will wrap up the report, but we are available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Con Gaines. Uh, impressive list, a lot of great work the city has done and a lot more work to continue to be done. So can we then uh, go, to, go to the public for public comment, please? Great. Now I get to speak. Sorry, I had grandkids snowflaking me about something good that happened to our family uh, just a little while ago and I was so distracted I wasn't paying attention. Um, okay. Uh, Matrix H, the use of force report. I, I, so it, it within within the uh, report, it says it was uh, uh, the basis of it was uh, the supervisor's report, which um, is a, a policy within the the police manual. Um, and uh, I think the basis for this report, it's the wrong basis. It should be the use of force report, which simply requires that when force is used, it has to be reported, very sensible. But when the supervisor, when it's based on a, uh, 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 the basis is the supervisor's report, when you look at policy 300.5.2, I know this is wonky, you see that that involves injury. So A through J, except for one exception, it's all about being injured by the four about because uh, it goes on in the summary of the report to say that worries that uh, coming from both uh, November 2020, but actually that's wrong too, because the IPAs 
for, on June 14th, 20, and so the report is saying Ms. Dellenbach, we, we lost you there. Ms. Dellenbach, you still there? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, sure lost some time. Okay, so the report is saying on the one hand, it wants to incorporate all of the expanded uses of force by the IPA um, but on the other hand, it's for some reason referencing the, uh, basing them on the uh, supervisor's uh, reporting, which then seems to limit it to injuries. And that's not sufficient. And it also mentions um, that it uh, uh, mentions uh, use of a gun. And yet, uh, specifically in June of 2021, the council and I have the motion and the motion passed that it says add point a gun uh, in addition to using a gun, point a gun. And so the report doesn't include everything and I'm gonna have to go back and look and make sure that the IPA scope of services reflects what actually the city council, Molly, did reflect what the council actually intended. So I just am saying that I this report at last sentence report, um, uh, I think may not be sufficient and possibly should be amended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aram James, you're now able to speak. Okay, again, uh, the clock is set at zero, zero. Okay, thank you. So, you know, I was actually the, the person back in June, thank you, Winner, for your, your comments, uh, that brought the issue of pointing a gun uh, uh, at someone as opposed to actually shooting them as an important data point. And it's the only time in the, the, my history of dealing with the city council that they voted unanimously for something that I brought up. It's, it's reported in the, in the Palo Alto online. I can, I can send that to you. Uh, but it's very important data point because often it reflects racial bias the gun being pulled uh, at black and brown people, it tra traumatizes you no matter what your race is. But that's the reason we brought that data point up. Janako was there that night. Uh, he kind of spoke it uh, down about the importance of that data point. The council voted 7-0 that it should be inclu included in future reporting. I'll send you that again, like by the end of this meeting. Um, I'm really excited about the RIPA uh, and the RMS. The, the, it, we're gonna have objective measurable data it already in January, this report indicates it was about 350 stops reported. My uh, calculations suggest by the time that it has to be reported for the first time, which is in April of 2023, we're going to have between five and 6,000 stops. Uh, my experience in this city, I've been here you know, since I was in grammar school, went to Bellhaven before that. I'm 73 years old, so I've been around Palo Alto a bit. And uh, I'm gonna bet uh, uh, that it's gonna show a huge disproportionality of black and brown people, even though they're, they're a very small percentage of the city of Palo Alto's population uh, because of gentrification. But I am, I'm, I'm glad that the state, the Department of Justice is requiring that the city of Palo Alto, I'm not sure that that would have occurred under Chief Johnson. Um, so the independent, independent uh, police auditor's report. I read all 46 pages of it, forgot to, and I'm glad that Winters pointed out I've missed the use of force. It looks, Miss Molly Stump, city attorney, that it's, it's scrubbed of race. All of the reporting in there is scrubbed of race. We've got another initiative that we pa passed about a year ago, Ash Cholera, who was a former public defender, now state assemblyman out of San Jose, passed you know the racial justice initiative, uh, racial justice act. I believe the IPA's report should no longer scrub uh, racial data. Like I tried to get the canine report, the, uh, the five uh, individuals attacked by dogs uh, that the, the chief reported out last year, but he wouldn't give me the race of those people. 
So anyway, there's some really good stuff that's going to go on here. I'm glad also that the kids are going to be start talking about a fictional lawsuit about reparations. But I, the only council member I've had a discussion with willing to talk about that was Greg Tanaka. I wish we it wouldn't be fictional. The city of Palo Alto would consider the issue of reparations now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. And we'll go back now to our council discussion. And Ms. Cormac, Council Member Cormack, please kick us off. Thank you, Chair Stone. And just because I haven't been in this committee in a while, is are we using time? Or are we just being cognizant of time? Just be, yeah, no, no time, especially since we only have one agenda item. But yeah, just try to maybe we can stay within like 10 to 15 minutes uh, for I've, council member on one round. No worries. All right. Thank you so much. And and is staff asking for an action on this, or are we just receiving the update? A clarification at this time this is an update report we did not bring specific recommendations as we continue to work on the items we have excellent thank you so much well let me start by saying that um i've had a few comments from people since our um retreat on saturday um indicating they were disappointed that we took social justice and said we think this is a value that we hold here in the community um and i was the person um to suggest that during the motion along with fiscal sustainability and other things and so i just want to state categorically um this is a personal priority for me and i believe all of the work that staff did last year uh is significant and should be ongoing uh, my suggestion was based on the fact that it hadn't come back to council, I think, more than once or twice, and there hadn't been much council interaction. I understand there had been some at policy and services. So just want to state for the record that this is incredibly important, just because it's not uh, listed out as one of the priorities the council is focusing on this year. Um, I appreciate the, um, the helpful letters. <laughs> Um, and I guess my question, uh, starting in order with what's been completed, would be around D. So, um, you know, lots of acronyms, those are always hard for people who aren't involved um, in this work day to day. How does a general person know about this program? Like, how would they know if they're sitting in their house and something is going on with a family member, whether or not they should call 911? Or should they do this instead? Will our dispatch center be able to make these referrals? Help me understand how that works. I will quickly turn it over to the assistant chief to explain the specific PD part, but I can say for the few programs, there are actually three at the county level. So there's PERT, and yes, I apologize for all the acronyms on the mental health programs because there are so many, but there's PERT, uh, which we have locally, and in that case, someone would dial 911 and the chief can give data on or information about how that works. There's MCRT, which is a county run program that anyone within Santa Clara County can utilize. Uh, and they're based in San Jose. So the response time has typically been slower for Palo Alto, but that one is a phone number. It's actually a 10 digit phone number. So for some that's very long, but to remember. And for the trust program, which is being worked on now, similar to Cahoots, they are looking to have a three digit number, but my understanding is they are having a difficult time with getting the clearance by whoever owns phone numbers to get the three digit number, but that is a priority of theirs. But Assistant Chief Bender, can you speak to how one would be served by PERT? Uh, good evening, everyone. Andrew Bender, Assistant Police Chief. I can definitely speak to PERT, and that is a program we rolled out just at the end of <clears throat> last year, and that's where uh, we have paired a behavioral health clinician from Santa Clara County um, that's a one FTE, a full-time employee with an officer. And that team is solely dedicated to addressing mental health issues within the city. Now, because we only have one, um, we only have them for 40 hours during the week. I've, I've shared in previous uh, forums that I'd love to have two or more, as a lot of cities would. Um, the good thing is that that team is not responsible or tied to calls for service. That's what we allow our patrol officers to do. So the PERT team has essentially the ability to freelance. So if a call comes in that's a mental health um, issue or crisis or has a mental health component, our PERT team will respond to that and either take over the call or assist the patrol, whatever is appropriate for that situation. Speaking of MCRT, that's the mobile crisis response team. That's a county generated team 
of behavioral health clinicians. We will, we will partner with them if um, there's a public number um, that they have where uh, a community member could reach out to them for a family member or someone that's in crisis that they'd like to get mental health help for. Um, MCRT generally will reach out to the police department. We will respond with them, but MCRT will generally take the lead on those type of handling those type of calls. Does that answer and your question? It does. It does. And the follow up would be what happens if, you know, the family and one of the responders decides that um, or the individual themselves that they want to be admitted? Um, who then does the transport? Under which circumstance, the PERT team or the MCRT? Whichever. Either. So, I mean, that if it's the PERT team, the police department will handle that transport. If, if okay. we take that person under uh, what we call a 72 hour uh, evaluation under 5150. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the values of the PERT team is they're, they're not wearing um, the police uniform like I am. They're dressed down in plain clothes. They do have, you know, police equipment on them, but they're, they're definitely more approachable and, and we would have them do the transport. Okay, that's super helpful. Thank you, Assistant Chief Bender. Um, and uh, my question about the data about um, in RMS about RIPA, we've had so many conversations about that for the past more than year and a half, um, was answered in E and C. Thank you for that. How will that data be available, though? Will it be published as a report, or will be people be able to access it and sort it themselves? Do we know yet? I would say we're still crafting that. I think both are viable options. I mean, it, it's gonna be available to the public for sure. You know, when some of the prior discussions that I've been involved in with this data is, I kind of equate it to, um, we have this, this data set, it's almost like a pile of Legos. What we'd like to do is put it together so it looks like uh, what's on the box that it comes in. So it tells the story, so to speak. And that's uh, really what we're gonna be working on over the next year to, to not only just have the data in its, its raw component, but to be able to, to talk and speak to the data. Yeah, I'm a big fan of following the instructions, but I think sometimes people like to get creative with their Legos. So we might, we might wanna do it both ways. Um, okay, uh, just two more things, Chair Stone. Um, the next would be section L. Um, so this, I recall, was something we had so much discussion about in 2020 is our own workforce and um, how uh, the public treats um, the people who work here and how we treat each other. Um, so I'm really excited to see that this is moving forward. I know it's taken a long time and, you know, it pains me to add something to the, the task list of all of you whom we see multiple times a week. <laughs> <laughs> when I know you're also trying to find more people to come and work here, but I just can't emphasize, you know, how important that is for me um, as we collect that data, which is the first step in understanding, you know, are there problems? And if so, how do we solve them? Um, and then with respect to all of the information at the end, thank you for that. I think there's one segment missing, and I read an interesting article today um, about um, members of the disabled population who are really wanting to access our parks more. Um, so I don't see much in there about our parks in terms of access for the disabled. Certainly we have Magical Bridge, which is a wonderful playground um, for people of all ages and all abilities. But if I think you know, about Foothills Park, for example, behind me. Um, you know, there's that new seven acres. And I know one of the things we had always talked about was making sure, seeing if when we extend it, that that would be a place that would be accessible because otherwise it's not really if you use a wheelchair um, or, you know, non-jogging strollers or walkers or what have you. Um, so I just mentioned that because that's, um, that's going to be a harder lift than, you know, the art center or the libraries or um, some of the other programs. So just wanted to throw that in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Cormack. Council Member Tanaka, would you like to go or do you want me to go next? If you're ready to go, I'm happy to give the floor to you. You can go if you want. All right, sounds good. Um, all right, well, again, th thank, you for the, thank you for the report, bringing this item forward. Um, really, I mean, it, it definitely was, was nice, nice to see kind of just how much has been has been kind of accomplished throughout the city and really in, in all it really in all areas so um just kind of want to give uh a, a shout out to 
to city staff, um, really just especially commend the HRC, libraries, the Children's Theater, the Public Art Commission, um, everybody that's been working on, on all of this. And also, I just the uh, I, I hope all the council members got a chance to go see the art of disability culture. That was really just an incredible experience. So really, really exciting that we're continuing that type of that that type of work. So a, a few questions. Let me. Uh, I guess I'll start off with you, uh, Assistant Chief Bender, uh, and and kind of and start off with um, kind of the question on on police on police radio and encryption. Yeah, I, I really do think I, do, I really do feel that the the city and, and news agencies and really the just the public all really are have been desiring and deserve just a, a real definitive answer on why is it that we can't incorporate what the CHP has done regarding police radio encry encryption. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think the police calls for service interactive map is a really nice feature. Uh, I don't know if everybody has had a chance to play around with it. I was playing around with it a little this morning. And and the information, I mean, even and even though it's it's cool and it's and it's interesting to play around with, the information is pretty limited and and vague. Um, I mean, really, all it does provide is a call time, a call type, call type description, call subtype, I think, and call subtype description. But but even the call type and the call type descriptions are are usually just a few words. I like I remember want some as welfare check or a suspicious person. Um, and I don't want to discount the work the department and city staff has has done on this, and I understand that this is in its beta phase, but I do think there are reasonable concerns that have been raised regarding transparency, uh, and if other agencies like the CHP can do it, it is curious why we can't here. So could, could you speak to that? Yeah, first of all, let me thank you for recognizing uh, the calls for service display map that we put out, and, and we have been um, receiving some some positive comments and some suggestions and that definitely was an attempt to really um, expand our ability to let our community know what was what's going on out there and that's that's really important to us you know in regards to the CHP I will tell you that um, we've looked into that um, there's other models out there as well there's um, San Francisco Police Department I believe is, is doing some other models I will tell you the devil is really in the details and um, one of the things, the challenges that uh, our agencies in our county it has it in compared to or differentiated from the CHP is a different radio system. Um, that's part of it. CHP doesn't have the ability, is my understanding, to, um, to um, encrypt their radios. And so they're working on a, a workaround. I do think that there are some, some significant um, considerations that uh, would need to be vetted out through, you know, the city attorney's office and the city managers if we really want to look into that option. There is also the option of, uh, or the um, issue of personnel within our communication center. We know that, you know, it could be as simple as having a dispatcher uh, broadcast calls for service on an unencrypted radio. And in a perfect world, that would, that would work. Um, we would need the personnel to do that. Um, staffing has continued to be a challenge for us. So I will just say that um, I wanna remind everyone that the calls for service map display that's out there is a beta. So we're open to suggestions. And you know we haven't closed the door on other options too. I think this was, um, this was a chance to at least get out in front of getting some more information out to the community. I'm not aware of any other law enforcement agency um, in our county or region for that matter, that's giving out that much as much information as we are through that calls for service data map. But again, we're open to um, suggestions and exploring all options if that's the direction that we're given. Uh, great, th th thanks for that. I and and glad to hear that the department. I mean, I know the department's open to exploring new options. I, I do think that's an area that is is worth pursuing, and I and I think that's an interesting distinction that CHP runs on a different radio encryption. I, I think that'd be a, a worthy legal analysis to see if that, if, if that is what allows the CHP to do what they're doing or, or not. I think that's worthy of the city attorney's office to, to look into it. Because I mean, I think from, from a layman's perspective, it, what the CHP is doing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, right? It, it's what they're doing is when they make a stop, they provide to dispatch uh, just like maybe the person's driver's license number or maybe a first or last name, but they don't like, they don't put it all together. So you would be able to kind of piece together a person's um, personal information. Is, is that how they do it? 
So let me say let me say two things. First of all, um, I'm not a radio expert. My understanding is is the Santa Clara County um, has a truncated radio system. I believe that the CHPs is not. Um, that's one of the issues. Um, my understanding of how they uh, are giving out information is similar to that. I do think that um, you know we just need to be careful about. Uh, the information that we put out because the DOJ has been very um, clear about their expert uh, expectations about putting out personal identifying information. And I think that the police department um, has a responsibility to adhere to that. I, yeah, no, I, I agree. We definitely have the res responsibility. I, I think I do, unless there's been additional, I, I saw the original DOJ memo, um, and I don't know how much kind of supplemental material has been released since then, but I, I feel like the initial one wasn't quite as clear as I had, uh, would, have, would have hoped. And it does seem, I would imagine the CH CHP has got to be one of the larger law enforcement agencies in the, in the state, maybe just behind, I don't know, LA, LA County. Um, so you know that does seem like a strong precedent that would be worthy to that would be worthy to to look into. Um, and I, I do think if if my colleagues are open to it, it would be be worth maybe directing that to to council to to then direct to um, direct staff to to pursue that uh, to pursue that more. Um, okay, thank thank you on thank you for that. Um, and it, while I while I've got you. Um, one, one thing that we have been hearing, kind of continuing on this transparency line, one thing we've been hearing is that from, from, some, of the, um, from some of our news agencies is that there has been a change in policy to prohibit officers from spe speaking to reporters directly. Um, is, is that true? So, you know, department policy is always regulated about uh, who's, who's identified or who has, a, you know, the, the ability to speak to the media. You know, one one of the things as we looked at um, you know operational um, flow within the police department, and you know, unfortunately, when we lost our PIO uh, in the summer of 2020, Janine De La Vega, you know, we had to look at how we best can communicate with uh, the press, and you know, we're 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 keeping stats on on how we respond to the press, and we've designated. Um, our watch commanders, which is kind of our first level managers of our patrol um, to follow up with the press. Now, of course, they're not there 24 hours a day. And I acknowledge that there's some frustration on that level. Um, but we do feel like we're being, as, uh, we're being receptive to those requests and that we're trying to make ourselves available. And you know, when uh, the big one comes or we feel like um, it's something that the community needs to know, we definitely wanna get out there and make sure uh, that we're communicating with our um, residents about what's going on. So I guess hypothetical to try to understand this, let's say, well, give my, my favorite, let's say uh, Anderson Cooper calls up a, a police officer. Sorry, Janati, I see you on there, but yeah, Anderson Cooper's pretty awesome too. <laughs> so let's say Anderson Cooper calls up a police officer um, to ask questions about some incident in Palo Alto. What does that police officer then say? I mean, do they say, do they have discretion to answer it or do they say, sorry, you have to speak to my watch commander and they have to go silent? I mean, of course we have interactions with people out on the, in, in the field. And I know that's not the example that you're giving, but we do have a process set up where we have um, a form that's completed online. We ask for um, deadlines and um, what you know, you're asking about and that's submitted. And then we triage that based on um, you know, those that are designated to follow up on that. And our watch commanders, like I said, are having conversations with our media partners. Um, we're tracking those stats and we try to be as receptive as possible. We understand that, you know, our media number one wants to know what's going on. They have a right to know and we wanna be responsive to their deadlines. We're trying our best to meet that with the balance of what we have in the building, the, the personnel. And, and, and good to know that you're tracing the stats. Is there a way, um, can that, can you send that to, to council? So um, I don't know what kind of form that's in, but maybe, maybe not overnight, but um, is that something that we can share with the council so we can kind of get a sense of this as well? I don't see an issue with that, but, you know, obviously uh, that would be a conversation with Ed and my boss, but I don't have a problem with that. 
Perfect. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Shikata and Chief Johnson. Apologize. <laughs> no, policy and service is a little more casual anyway, so that that's fine. Um, okay. Th thank you. Yeah. I mean, I do. Yeah. I think there is a legitimate concern there. I mean, we do want to make sure that the press has has access to to, to law enforcement. So I, I do think that's another area that's worthy that's worthy looking looking into. Um, but let's see. Um, so now turning to um, our city attorney. Real, real quick, um, can, can you provide a, a brief summary of SB2 and its implications to policing in Palo Alto? Sure, I, I, I'm happy to chat with you about that. Just um, as a department head, unrelated to the police response to the media, I just have a, a sort of contextual comment on that exchange that just happened. It's very important when the city speaks to the media that we are speaking definitively and giving accurate and complete information. And so I think as department heads, one of the things that we try to be mindful of is making sure that the media has the right contact person who has not just one, one vision of, or one set of facts, but is able to gather all of the relevant facts and vet them and make sure that the information is not only timely, but accurate so that we are, uh, facilitating good quality communication with our public. And, and so that's kind of part of the reason for being organized around how we interface with our media partners. It's not to prevent people from gaining information, it's to ensure that the information has a level of quality and synthesis that sometimes an individual employee doesn't have. My yeah, and I, I mean, and I'm not saying there's no rational basis uh, for, the, for the policy, but I do think it, it's important the the perception of transparency for the for the public, and this does have a this does have a feeling of being of of trying to put up guards um, between the media and and those who are on the ground being an eyewitness. So definitely worthy. I, I agree. There could be definitely some very reasonable reasons behind it, but would I think worthy of us looking into that a little more. Which is why I'm sharing my perspective because I hope that we can help to educate the public and our media partners about why we have these procedures. Absolutely. Okay, um, SB2. SB2 is a new state law. It increases accountability for um, uniformed peace officers throughout the state of California by doing quite a number of things. And I, I'm not um, prepared to give you a full and detailed briefing on it this evening. Happy to send some information sheets um, uh, your way or council's way. Um, the law is complex. It authorizes the um, Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training um, post um, to do some investigative work at their level. That's the state level certification agency that um, uh, trains and certifies peace officers at the front end of them becoming peace officers. And now SB2 gives them some greater ability to do uh, monitoring and even investigating, and in some cases, appropriate cases do decertification of, of peace officers so that they will not have that uh, ability to work as a peace officer anywhere in California. Um, that interfaces with local, um, local police agencies uh, in terms of um, our um, system for performance management, hiring, separation, discipline, citizen complaints, investigations. There's increased reporting obligations to post. Um, and an opportunity them, then for them to interface at that state certification level in appropriate cases. Okay. Um, and so, and I, I would imagine, and I know this is probably more of a question for maybe for our city lobbyists, but do we know, are there is there anything kind of in the pipeline that is um, that is continuing to? Because I know last year there were there were um, there was legislation being considered around binding arbitration. I don't I know that did not pass. I'm curious, kind of what the where that stands. If if you have any awareness, or if that's just a a question for our lobbyists when when we speak to them again. You know, I think it would be best. <laughs> Sacramento is a not. Um, I hate to use this word transparent, but it's it, it's an opaque place. Um, I would I do not know uh, everything that is going on in the halls of uh, 
uh, the legislative uh, building there. Um, so I think that the person to ask there is our, our state lobbyist in terms of, there were quite a few bills that were proposed last year, um, as is often the case in an area where the state legislature is, you know, has interest, um, you know, some things fall away, other things, um, you know, make it through and, and um, sometimes several ideas are synthesized. So we did have a couple of significant bills that um, were passed last session. I don't know. Um, uh, maybe Ms. Cotton Gaines does have some input or recollection from talking to the lobbyists um, what the level of interest is in continuing um, uh, reforms this year, or are we more in a holding pattern to see how these um, things that were um, adopted last year are going to actually play out? Yeah, um, so the lobbyist is, thank you so much, Molly. The lobbyist is keeping an eye out on police reform bills as that is one of our legislative guidelines. Specifically to your question about binding arbitration, right now the bills have not been reintroduced this year. That was the piece, I believe, of SB2 that was taken out last year in order for it to pass, um, just based off the legislative process. So in checking with the lobbyists thus far, uh, they there has not yet been a bill submitted on that topic, but there's still one more week where people can submit bills. So we'll know better uh, by the end of next week, I believe, is the, the time frame. Great. Thank, thank you. And well, we, we're scheduled to speak with lobbyists. Uh, is that May? So yeah. Next month. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And but I'll if try there are questions or other things, I'm in regular communication with them. So feel free to share. Oh. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, if you, next time you speak with them, if you can just ask, uh, ask uh, for an update on that, that'd be great. All right. And I will try and I will uh, stick to my own, try to commitment of the 15 minutes. So I know I probably went over apologies. Uh, uh, Council member Tanaka, do you have any questions? I do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you guys for your work. I know that uh, it's hard, a lot of work, so really appreciate it. Um, so I know we looked at racism against black and brown people, and it seemed like at one uh, uh, of the recent council meetings, there was a majority of council members interested in also looking at racism against Asian Americans. And I was just wondering, how are we doing in this regard? Can you be a little bit more specific, Council Member Tanaka? I just sure. want to know if you were yeah, providing so I, I think, I think we, um, I, think, I think last year we, um, we uh, on council voted to look at racism against black and brown people. I think uh, the uh, HRC did a wonderful job in, in that. Um, at the time, I was trying to also get us, get us to also look at racism against Asian Americans as well of Asian hate crimes happening. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't, I wasn't able to get enough support at that time. But on, 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 when I came back to council, it seemed like there was a, um, I think Councilman Cormack and a few others voice like, well, maybe we should have also looked at um, racism against Asian Americans. It's, you know, we're, we're the large, largest ethnicity right now in Palo Alto. Um, and, you know, you heard incidents like at Fukushima and others that are, that continue to happen. And it just seems like a miss. And I think, I think, I, I, I haven't asked uh, Chair Stone explicitly, but I think he would also probably share that concern, but just was wondering what was the plan there? Gotcha. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I think two parts probably come to mind. Um, the first is I think council cast a wide net for the equity work in general so that a lot of things could be addressed. So I, I don't think the opportunity is lost. I think that's the point of the, uh, council member Cormac also referencing this being a value and we continuing to do the work ongoing. So I do want to state that uh, slowness doesn't mean lack of attention forever. Um, the other piece of it is policy and services last year did have a recommendation that you were sending to full council and we didn't get a chance to get it to the full council yet. And I think that's where um, that full dialogue was intended to take place. So we are working to get that on a council agenda, uh, which was some of the interest in the hate crime conversation. So I think that's addressing your question, but let me know if I missed something. Uh, and the last part on upcoming events, I think um, all the events that the library and CSD do, those are one piece of it, but also as we're talking to boards and commissions about microaggressions, et cetera, it's all interconnected and helping everyone in our community really see the importance of um, the work we're doing little by little together. So I think all those things are kind of interconnected. I hope that helps. It, it does. Um, actually, I remember that even I was talking a little bit about this work. I forgot who was talking about, but I think even the chair expressed interest in looking to this as well. So I, 
that's why I was just trying to figure out like what was the next step, what has to happen in order for this to to move forward, and especially about the racism against, you know, at the time, like way back when, about a year or so ago, I thought we should also look at racism against Asian Americans because I've heard a lot about it as well, and so that's that's what I was referring to. So I, I think, um, uh, you know. I think we definitely should be looking at racism against black and brown people, but why not Asian Americans, especially given the, um, the fact that there's actually a lot of Asian Americans in Palo Alto these days. So um, this, seems, this seems to make sense to me. That's why I was just trying to understand where staff was on this. And also the HRC chair actually was interested in doing this as well. So I, it seems like there's alignment from a lot of folks, from folks on council, HRC. So I'm just trying to figure out like what, what was going on here. Okay, well, so I, I don't know what more, like, well, so what would it take, does a, is HRC enabled to just go ahead and start doing it or what has to happen? Are you specifically speaking to the conversation on the ordinance ideas that you had for the council? I just want to- Well, make there's actually that, I was, I, I was actually gonna ask about that, but I, I was first gonna ask more about the, we had a really comprehensive, um, like 100, I think they did 100 conversations or gotcha. I forgot the exact number, but some large number of conversations. conversations on race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think there was interest in trying to expand this also to cover racism against Asian Americans. And so that's what I was referring to. I actually had a second question about the not ordinance <laughs> or the, not the ordinance, but, you know, uh, Chair Stone, myself, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Ku, we all voted unanimously to uh, you know, put something forward in front of council. So I was going to ask you about that. So you answered that before I even asked, which is great. Okay. <laughs> but what, but what I was referring to was really the the HRC interest. And I, I've talked to the chair and he's, he's interested in doing this, but I, you know, I guess I'm just trying to understand how does that fit in the work plan right now? Gotcha. And I think that, thank you for clarifying that as well. So the HRC will be having their retreat on Saturday. I believe that's where they'll be discussing their work plan. And I think all of the board and commission work plans will still come to the city council. So I think there's a few opportunities for the council to weigh in on uh, the work that the HRC will do. And they're more, more than excited to engage with us and make sure we're all kind of marching in the same direction on uh, efforts around all these issues with race and equity. So I, I think that information shared with the chair will be helpful before the retreat on Saturday as well. I was just trying to figure out if there's more action we have to take either here or a council in order for this to happen. I, I'm looking to Molly just so I make sure I'm not stepping out of turn. So is your interest to have the HRC take on an additional task and that's the recommendation? Yeah, so so basically, you know, so I think um, when we asked the HRC to to look at racism against black and brown people, I made the motion to also look at racism against Asian Americans. Unfortunately, I, I failed because it, no, I didn't get a second, right? So, so it passed without, without that happening. And, um, but at the most recent council meeting, when it came back, right, I think there seemed to be, um, you know, from the HRC chair and HRC themselves, as well as from, I didn't do exact count, but it seemed like there was a, you know, uh, a majority, at least in my opinion, but maybe, you know, maybe we should take an explicit vote to actually also look at racism against Asian Americans. And so that's why I'm just trying to figure out like, so what's, what's gonna happen now? Do we have to take, do we actually, should we have taken a formal vote? Could we take a formal vote? Like, do we do it here and then go back to council? I'm just trying to figure out what do we do here? Or I just want, I want something to happen versus just nothing happening, right? So Ms. Cotton Gaines, the, the 100 conversations on race, the, that was not exclusive of, of any race, was it? No, it was, it was just for black and brown people. I'll check the website. I don't think it was that. And actually, the HRC, um, and I think even Councilmember Cormack. Actually, Councilmember Cormack, wave her hand, Chair. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Um, my, my recollection is slightly different from Councilmember Tanaka's. I don't believe we had a vote on it. I do remember asking. Oh, I don't the, think we had a vote on it. I agree with yeah. you on that. So the chair of the HRC, when it came forward, if we could expand it um, to Asian American and Pacific Islanders, and they were not prepared to take that on at that time. The, the specific instructions were around the lived experiences. Um, I just have to make sure that I, I don't mix up the history part with the, with the other, but it was not, it was not, um, 
it was not as broadly defined as as it could have been, and we discussed that recently when they came forward. Um, and and I think the I think the the chair agreed that um, that would be the next step. Um, so I think if we can view it more as an evolution, um, I think that might be helpful. And then I'm, I want to go next, Council uh, Chair Stone, when when uh, Councilmember Tanaka is done. And if I can just add on to what Council Member Cormack said, the City Council directed the HRC, I believe in 2020, to do the history of Black and Brown people in Palo Alto. That was a specific vote assignment. That's right. And from the City Council, along with one or two other assignments, 100 community conversations on race um, was not something that the City Council voted to have the HRC do that I'm aware of. Uh, and I'm glancing at their the web page for the 100 community conversations and they they have a, a lot of focus on belonging, diversity, equity, inclusion. I, I don't think they gave the specific uh, racial groups that people had to speak about, just from what I can recall. Um, anyways, I, 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 um, I've spoken to Chair even afterwards and he, you know, was interested in doing something like this, but he also, I think, felt need to be empowered by the council as well. And that's what I'm just trying to understand what do we have to do to make it happen? It could come as a recommendation from this committee, if that's something that you'd like to share okay. with. Can we, can we do that tonight? Yes, we uh, oh, okay. have this Great. item okay. listed. Okay, well then maybe chair, when, when the time comes, I'll make the recommendation. Okay, great. The second thing is, and, and, and this thing you brought up and I, I was gonna bring it up as you beat me to the punch here, was when, um, the motion that uh, the announced motion that we made last year um, about you know trying to figure out if there's a misdemeanor or some, something we do about some of the um, uh, anti Asian hate um, stuff going on, and and so you said it's going to you guys were a little bit backlogged and it's going back to council and I I wasn't really quite clear so what's the timeline on that? We have been working to get it to the city council just with other priorities it has had to move, but we're actively still working to get it on an agenda. And um, we're aiming for an action discussion just because it was such a large item we wanted to sure. make sure that the full city council could engage on it. So that's why the scheduling constraints have been a bit harder. Sure, do we, do we have any ETA as to when that will happen? I will follow up uh, at our agenda planning this Monday. I, I'm not, I don't have an exact date at this time. Okay. So we'll soon like email us, letting us know. Sure. I can okay, do that. great. Okay. As long as I'm not doing any brown act violation, yes, I will follow great, up. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then the other thing is um uh so in terms of the um in terms of the uh records management system, have we been keeping track of hate crime incidents and 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 do we have that by race and you know incidents, stuff like that? Is there some sort of grouping? Or, or like visualization of this? I can answer that. Yeah, we're, we're keeping track of hate crimes. And we're also, um, we also have a practice of um, keeping, of reporting on, taking reports on hate incidents. So we're keeping both of those in the system. Okay, do we, do we have a visualization of like, I'm just curious to see what is, what's the breakdown of it by race in our city? That's not something I could produce for you right now, unfortunately. Okay. Does that data exist somewhere? We could. I'm assuming we could mine it in the system. Okay. Um, okay. Do we have to make a motion, or are you guys just planning to do it already? You can drop if you want to make a, a motion, council member. You can do that. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. So maybe chair, when the when the time is correct, I'll I'll uh, I'll do that. Thank you. Any more questions for now? Uh, not right now. Thank you. No. All right, uh, Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Chair Stone. Um, so, um, and staff can help me. I was hoping this would be a referral at our retreat to policy and services, but I think it's related to this topic. So let me just surface it here, and you can let me know if we should. I should continue here, or if I should wait and move it to that. And that's that I would like council members um, to take the training that you described, having been offered to the boards and commissions on microaggressions and diversity in general. Um, and so um, is that something that we could discuss here in the context of this item um, as a recommendation or does staff suggest that I wait and have that conversation at the 
continuation of our retreat when we get to referrals to our own committee. <laughs> I, love, I love the circle you just drew for all of us. <laughs> um, I, I think it fits fine within this agenda item. Okay, great. Um, so when when we get to motions, which I didn't think we were going to have, that's um, one that I, I hope my colleagues will consider. Um, frankly, I think we've been remiss in not doing it yet, um, but better late than never. All right. Any more questions? No? Okay. And I think I've got just one more question then to, to follow up on, and then I'll open the floor to, to motions. Seems like we'll have a few, which is great. Um, can, can, so can staff follow up on the issue that was brought up by both public speakers regarding uh, uh, regarding the previous council direction? When was it back in maybe back in June? Um, regarding when a gun is being pulled and, and pointed at somebody and having that data point recorded in our use of force reports, can can staff speak to that? You know, we have worked really hard to get this right, um, and my office, the city manager's office, the police department have worked with our IPA to make sure that we really mapped very carefully what council was wanting onto the scope of what the IPA um, was going to be doing. And, and we think we nailed it. So um, I'm happy to um, send Winter those documents if she wants to look again. There was a time when she spotted a, a mismatch there and we definitely appreciated that and that improved um, our product. Um, but we think we've got it this time. I'm open to hearing if we didn't. Um, but I don't think we have any further work to do on that. Um, Assistant Chief Bender, do you have uh, additional comments or thoughts on that? I do. We uh, in the police department, because I personally participated in them, did have conversations with uh, with Mr. Janako and Mr. Conley about that very thing. And uh, we did come to agreement about um, how we would send them those incidents. If I recall correctly, when uh, this was first, this uh, topic was first discussed, I think Chief Johnson mentioned this may happen two or three times over the year. I think he was right. We've set up um, in our CAD system, our computer automated dispatch system, or now our, our, our RMS system with the ability to flag those. We've also reached out to our supervisors to uh, ensure that um, those are flagged. And we've also um, regave the department training um, as part of when it's, you know, when policy dictates um, when we're pointing a firearm and tactics and that sort of thing, because that is something that we take serious. And so um, to date, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had one of those instances show up. You know, officers do draw their gun, um, but uh, to point it at someone, we're not having those show up to this point, but we are prepared and the, um, and OIR is prepared to receive those incidents when they do happen. Okay, so since the policy went into place, no one had, no officer has pointed a gun at, at anyone. That I'm aware of, yes. Okay, thank you. And yeah, Ms. Stump, if you could follow up and, and send that to Ms. Dallenbach and Mr. James as well, I'm, I'm sure you have both their email addresses. All right, perfect. Thank you. Those, um, I believe that those are the, the rest of my questions. So I'll open the floor now to motions. Council member Tanaka. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was wondering um, if we could, uh, I guess we probably don't have a screen here, but uh, I'd like to make the motion that we um, expand the HRC role to look at racism against Asian Americans. And I'm looking for staff to give feedback as to whether this is the right language. So you know, feel free to comment. And then um, to, um, the comment earlier, um, also for staff to have a breakdown of hate crimes by time and race. So we can see how is it growing and you know, which, which ethnicity is being affected the most. And I think uh, Council Member Cormack um, had a good one as well, which is- Hold that, on, sorry. Council Member, if I uh, think uh, the clerk's still trying to catch up on your first- oh, sorry, two. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you re just repeat that? Okay, sorry, I wasn't even looking at the screen. Let me, let me go look at the screen here. Um, yeah, okay, expand the HRC role to look at racism against Asian Americans. I race. Ra racism against. Oh, Asian racism. Americans. Yeah, sorry. Or AAP, AAPI, whatever is easier for you to write. Um, and then, um, and then uh, to, 
the question earlier is to have a breakdown of hate crime by time and race. So we could see how is it increasing or decreasing and also by different ethnicities. Okay, and I think the other one, I think Councilmember Cormac mentioned, which I, I also liked was um, to um, have council members do the, is it called microaggression training? What was the formal name? I forgot. Yeah, microaggression training. You know, is there anything else that we talked about that we should do? Uh, I would. Well, is that is that the motion, and then we'll, I guess we'll get uh, yeah, a second. Yeah, I'm just trying to capture. I I'm trying to capture all the good ideas that were mentioned, but I I don't know if I missed something. Well, my mine, uh, which I would which I would add, so if you want to in, include it sure. now, would be to refer to council a discussion regarding police radio encryption. Oh, that's right. Sorry, I missed that. You're right. Okay, please. Yes. Um and and possible action items related to decrypting police radio consistent with policies like the California Highway Patrol and or other departments. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if staff wants to wordsmith that, or I know Council Member Cormack's always very good at that too. Council Cormack is awesome at that. So <laughs> Council Cormack, I would love your, your precision here. Sorry, Clark, did you get um, D there? You Sorry, I did not refer to council. No worries. Uh, a discussion regarding police radio encryption and possible action items possible action items related to decrypting police radio consistent with policies Sorry. Uh, like the California Highway Patrol and or other departments. And I think that's clear enough that the end there is referring to other departments that have also decrypted their police radio, but if others don't think it is, then then please weigh in. Great day. So that's the that's was there anything else, Councilmember Tanaka, in your in your motion? No, I that's I, I was just trying to capture some of the discussion here. And, and um yeah, thank you for D. Um uh, yeah, so that's the motion. Unless I don't know, Councilmember Cormac, if you have any I, I've tried to capture everything, but I don't know if there's other stuff we should put in here. I think perhaps the chair is still awaiting um a second. I, yep. I well, don't know yeah. that it's been seconded. It, it hasn't yet. If you want to second it, if not, I'll second it. Uh, not what's written. I'm not interested in seconding. So okay. if somebody else wants to second it, then we can start um, getting the language. I will second it and then go ahead and, and wordsmith. So you've both spoken to it and you'd like me now? Uh, well, Council Member Tanaka, do you want to speak to the motion or have you? I, I think I kind of have. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Great. And um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think this is, I, I think this is a, a, I think this is a good start. Um, obviously there's, there's a lot more to, to be done, but I, I think this is a, a, this is a good start. I think, um, I believe, yeah, I think, I think the HR, HRC is already looking at racism um, across, you know, of, across different ethnicities and, and nationalities and, and races, but um I think Council Member Tanaka makes a good point that we have had a particular focus on on Black and and Brown members of our community. Um, maybe not as much on Asian Americans, especially with the rising incidents of hate crimes in the region and and country. This does seem to require a, a particular focus. So I do think that additional direction to the HRC makes sense at this time. Um, I am curious to hear from staff on on B, just as far as whether that's already being done, and if and if it's not. I think it's absolutely critical that we that we do that. Um, and see, I, I, I like that idea when Councilmember Cormack brought that up. 
it was funny. I was actually engaged in a microaggression training just today uh, for my for my school district for three hours, and we do it all the time, and it's really great. I think I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, but you know, you no matter how much you think you work on, you do this work. Um, it's always incredible what you what you learn, and and sometimes it's you know you're not happy to learn that uh, that that you have these microaggressions. And so being able to identify that and being able to try to address it is really critical. And, and D, I already spoke to that uh, earlier. So, so that those are my comments. I just have a quick cleanup thing for, yes, I don't please. see, um, but that's just a direct council instead of staff. Yes, good idea. And then whenever appropriate, we can provide some more feedback. And so can I ask just a quick question kind of um, process wise here on on a because I think like if, if it's a unanimous vote then depending on the type of item it would just go on to consent and a seems like one that would be perfect for consent I don't see why that would require a, a council discussion the others maybe so is that just uh, I'm wondering kind of the, just the process there uh, Ms. Con Gaines I'm actually going to look to Ms. Stump just to make sure um so in general, if something passes committee unanimously, it can go to consent unless it's a larger discussion and we kind of make it clear we want it to go to action. So for something like this, Ms. Stump, what would you uh, recommend? Well, I think we need to see um, how the committee and kind of lands on this, the three of you. Um, generally, we haven't broken up committee actions into component parts and put some on consent and some on action. They They tend to to be aggregated together. Um, so I, I think maybe that some additional dialogue needs to happen about whether the committee is going to end up with a unanimous um, recommendation on this or or not. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, I can't see the speakers, but I assume Councilmember Cormack, you have your hand raised. I do. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Stone. Yes. Um, okay, wordsmithing time. Um, all right, on A. Um, I, I confess I don't quite understand exactly what you're asking, Councilmember Tanaka. The HRC's role is vast and I believe already includes racism of all kinds. Are you specifically asking that the 100 conversations be, there be a new version of it? Are you asking them to take on a work stream related to Asian Americans? Help well, me understand, because if I was on the HRC, I'd be like, well, what, what is it that you want from this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, during the readout to us on council, uh, which was like, I guess, what, two months ago or so now? I, I forgot exactly when. It's all a blur during COVID. <laughs> That's right. January 24th. January 24th, okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the chair um, remarked that, um, and I, in fact, I think you remarked as well, and I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. And I recall the remark, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that um, it was a miss that, we looked at the history of, um, I guess, the black and brown people in our community, uh, but failed to do that for Asian Americans. And I think the chair, uh, and I don't have the minutes in front of me, so you know you could probably go back and look at the minutes for, for you know exact history. But um, thought that it would have been good to actually have done that. And I I agree. I mean, I, I made the motion to do it the first time, but I wasn't enough. I wasn't able to get support for it at the time. But it seemed like. Most council members were, as well as the HRC as a whole, as far as I could tell, seemed to be very supportive of that. So this seems to make sense to me. I, maybe it's so, perfunctory. Maybe it's going to happen already. No, I don't no, know. I'm but, just, I'm just trying to, to, to really get some clarity. So are yeah. you asking? Are you interested in having the HRC do the same historical work for the Asian American community? I think that would actually be really good. I mean, so I, I've talked to some Asian Americans here. They've been here for like three or four generations. So I think that would actually be a good idea. Okay, so that that is something that, that I think is more specific. It'd be easier if I was on the HRC to understand. Um, is there additional work you want them to do or, or should we change A to, to be more? Um, um, you know, I, I, I guess the, the main thing is, and, and, the, and the chair, um, and I, I talked to him, um, it, seemed like, it seemed like he was looking for more authority, right? And I, I just want to kind of, I realize the charter is quite broad, but I, I think they also look to us in terms of uh, what what um, 
what their scope is, right? And you know, the fact that the Asian American wasn't part of the scope kind of bothered them a bit, at least as far as I can understand. Okay. You may have a, so, a slightly different read, but it, that's that's kind of the the took I the take I I got. Okay, so perhaps just a suggestion A could be. Uh, request the Human Relations Commission to research the lived experience of Asian American and Pacific Islanders in Palo Alto and add other work plan items uh, related to this topic as desired. Okay, that sounds great. I, I love I love your finesse here. Okay. I'm not sure I remember what I said. Um, <laughs> sure. Perhaps Ms. Cotton Gaines can help uh, the, the clerk who's desperately trying to keep up with this wide ranging conversation. Um, yeah, I, I think the language matched more of the recommendation that the council gave previously for the HRC. So it was um, request. Yeah. Did I say request? Mm -hmm. um, Human Relations Commission to research the lived experience. of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in, in Palo Alto. Yes, good. And, and suggest other work plan um, items as, uh, and suggest related work plan items as desired. Does that look about right? That's very close. You can take out the word other. Um, and let's just put as desired at the end of that phrase. All right, Council Member Tanaka, does that, does that capture what you're hoping for and give the HRC sufficient latitude? It does. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your help there. Appreciate it. All right, now let's get going on B. I accept that as well. Okay. I know I didn't want to call on you to accept your own thing, but we are being a little more informal, which is good. All right, so for B, um, I don't think you're asking the council to do these breakdowns. Are you asking the police department to provide data about hate crimes? Yeah, um, I mean, it was just back to what I was asking um, Andrew, right? Right. About, but yeah, what's and, the and time it, part? What is the time part? Oh, it's just, there? I thought it would be interesting to see it. Like, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? That, that's what I was trying to get at. Like, and and Assistant Chief Bender, how far back do we have this information? I mean, we can, I could check. We, it's something that I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'd have to get back to you. If the council wants to set a window or an expectation that they'd like to see go back, we'll do our best to accommodate. Do you want to start with whatever's recent and give the police department a little bit latitude and then we can adjust from there? Councilmember Tanaka? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm just trying to, I'm basically what I'm trying to figure out is trends. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, that's what I was asking when they started collecting it. So why don't we just say to provide um, hate crime data um, over time by race. And sure. uh, pardon my um, ignorance, um, is there something that race captures that ethnicities doesn't or? <laughs> no, I think, I think. Okay. Well, this is part of all of our, our, our work to be careful with our, okay, uh, Ms. Cotton Gaines is suggesting perhaps we should have them both. Is that what the back and forth meant? Yeah. Oh. I think it's fine either way. There, there's a uh, distinction. But Ms. Portillo well, is nodding. Perhaps we do want race and, race and ethnicity. Yeah, it, I don't know how granular the data will actually be, but there is a difference between just the two categories. If you wanted to speak to that. Ms. Portillo, anything to add here? Uh, there is a difference between race and ethnicity, but I but I don't know again, you know, how that data is captured 
and whether that distinction is made. Okay, well, I think we can trust our police department to provide us with whatever information they have and we can adjust from there. And then if the clerk just on B here to provide, um, you can get rid of after provide the words data of. Okay, great, let's move on to three. I don't think we can direct any our council members to do things much as um, some of us might like to. Um, I think we can probably strongly recommend, we can request. Um, Ms. Stump, am I correct that we probably cannot direct our colleagues what to do? Um, so let's go with strongly. I think so. I, yeah, yeah. I think you, yeah, I think you can, can recommend that council commit um, on, uh, for itself that each council member will. Okay, commit to, um, great. Um, and I think we should time bound that. Um, you know, I know during COVID, I've been a little bit more relaxed about bounding things, but um, perhaps that should be completed by the end of June. I don't know quite how often um, it's offered Miss Cotton Games, and presumably we'd need to do it in three groups so we didn't have any Brown Act violations. Yes, um, I think there are options. Right now we have uh, three tentative dates on calendar for board and commission members. And we're actually just letting people pick a date that works Perfect. so that we don't have the one whole group at one training per se. So if the council were looking to just slot into that, I think we should be able to get around Brown Act pretty easily or not around. Let me restate that. We should not have Brown Act concerns in that case. Okay. Um, if we were looking for the city council to do a session all together, I think that would be a little different. I, you know, I think it's probably better for us to split up and, you know, participated in it with board and commission members. So um, council member Tanaka, if you're um, amenable to it. Uh, so let's say commit to complete microaggression training um, by June 30th. I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't know if, uh, how the chair feels. That's fine with me. Yeah, so two, two options on doing that training consistent with the Brown Act. One would be to break council members up into smaller groups, and the other would be to do it in a public session. And that may actually not be ideal in terms of the um, goals and the way that the training is scheduled. It might, uh, the, the training is offered, it might be that it's more effective for people to not be participating in it in a public setting. You know, speaking to my own experience, I think it's, um, these can be difficult conversations and I think it's probably best as people are learning about mistakes they may or may not have been making to get an opportunity to do that in a smaller, um, smaller arena. Um, I appreciate the, the option, but as I think about what we're trying to achieve, we're really trying to um, get all of us to notice and make changes. And I think that might be harder to do um, unless we have an area that we can practice them. But thank you for the suggestion. And All right, and now D. Um, Council Member Cormack, I'm yes. sorry, just really briefly on C as well. Um, we also have been thinking about what a council session as a whole or a study session of some sort on this topic can look like with some of the professionals we've worked with at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Who was one that worked with us for the hate crime event that we held in the fall, as well as um, I'm gonna, uh, Dr. Lori, I cannot think of her last name right now. Who's um, Mackenzie Nishimura. Thank you. Who's pretty welcome. close. I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah, she did an amazing job at the w Women and Girls Summit. And then again at the, I um, uh, can't remember what the most recent one was, but just wonderful speaker. I think it was a League of Women Voters event. Yeah. yeah, so we're hoping to have some sort of opportunity for some dialogue with the full city council in a study session format with some of those resources as well. But I think with- So that will fulfill the public part we're talking about. Exactly. And okay. so it's kind of the timing of these two, we'll just make sure that it works in sync. But I think there's opportunity for the group dialogue to happen around the topic. Uh, as well as the, the space to participate in the training. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now on D, um, refer a discussion and possible action items. Uh, so could I offer- to, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could I just offer 
a framing comment here. So the, the city is under an, a mandate, a, a legal obligation um, articulated by the DOJ that we must encrypt uh, confidential, personally identifiable information that is transmitted over the radio. So I, I think maybe as you're thinking about refining this, maybe we don't wanna be focusing so much on de decryption, but on um, methods of um, a media and public communication about police activities consistent with the DOJ's legal, you know, the legal requirements. Uh, you know, I'll turn to the maker and seconder and see if they'd like to amend it. This, this, this part I have more concerns about. So let me see if you, if the two of you would like to make any changes. And I'll take a break. Councilmember Tom you, you, you made the motion, but I know I brought up D. Do you want me to speak to it? Please, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Miss Stump, I'm, I'm open to, I'm open to changing the, the language. I, me I meant for this to just be a kind of a, a conversation starter for us to, to tweak the language. I, I, but I, I don't want, I don't want this to move beyond giving us the option to really explore some of the more maybe out of the box thinking that maybe other jurisdictions are doing or what the CHP is, is doing. So um, I'm open to whatever language that, that you want, that, that you think would be best here that I can kind of keep that spirit, but kind of both within the spirit of what I want the motion to be and also what the spirit of the DOJ memo was. Okay, I'm thinking. <laughs> Yeah, the DO, I don't think of legal legal mandates from the state as <laughs> in terms of a spirit, but I, I guess there, there's a, a sense, yes. Um, okay, I'll jump back in while you're thinking, if mm -hmm. I may. Yes. Um, perhaps what we're looking for is a study session. Um, maybe we request that the, you know, the mayor schedule a study session um, that enables us to ask more questions and the department to provide more information and the public, um, because I feel like we're, we might be skipping a step here and we haven't sort of had the full discussion of it. So I, I wonder, having seated the floor and taken it back, um, if the maker and seconder would consider uh, requesting that the mayor schedule a study session on police radio transmissions and the ability for the public and the media um, to get, to be rapidly informed of um, calls for service. Okay. I think that's a really helpful idea. I think there might be some belief out there that um, this is some kind of discretionary decision and it, it really isn't. And, I, you know, I know the police department would welcome the opportunity to explain um, all the things that they have done and to hear ideas for, for um, additional approaches. Um, and, and I would welcome the opportunity to, to talk with the public about constitutional privacy and um, you know, the, the very significant obligation that we have as a city and as um, city officers and employees to respect the constitutional privacy of, of everyone that we come into contact with. So a question on on then on if it's if it's a if it's a study session, what level of kind of what level of of staff preparation and, and research go goes into that? I just I guess I guess my concern here is uh, Ms. Stump, your your answer there was kind of more around like this would give the police and the city the chance to be able to almost kind of defend the current the current policy. And but what Assistant Chief Binder was saying earlier was that um, there hasn't been. I'm not saying he 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 has been saying anything different than what you just said, but he he mentioned something along the lines of like we haven't had a chance to maybe do the research of to see if policies like the CH like the CHP's policy would be able to work in Palo Alto or, and or maybe other departments. So oh, um, I'll, I'll let him respond. But they have done a tremendous amount of work in the city manager's office, as well as in the police department. And, you know, frankly, Mr. Chair, there, there's been, you've referred to other cities and out-of-box thinking, but we're not aware of any. 
and our, our police uh, leadership has really conferred with their colleagues. So other than the CHP um, example, and, and there may be some logistical or technical um, issues there that make it difficult for us to, but, we, but I think that's, that's a fair point of learning more about that and um, exploring whether that can map or in elements of that can map um, uh, in, uh, into our city. But other than that, we're not aware. Uh, so if, if you have cities that you want us to look at that we somehow haven't, um, please share. Well, no, that, well, that, well, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm asking here is, is a if it's a study session, is that level of preparation done beforehand with that type of, with that type of research and, and legal analysis, or is that really only done if this is then an action item with maybe recommendations to, to no, I'm just trying I mean, to understand the process piece I here. I think the, it, the issue, well, I'll, I'll let the police department speak for it, but I think the issue continues to churn and the city cares a great deal about its communication um, with the public through the media. Um, we also have to comply with the law. So, um, you know, there's, there's been, a, you know, a lot of effort here to do something innovative to try to advance the ball. And I think, you know, if more talk is needed, um, I think you'll see that there's a lot of research um, and um, preparation. And then it, something more needs to be done than just say, this isn't enough, things need to be different. We, we need council members also who believe that there are specific things that, that can be done in addition to begin to identify those so that we can engage with them. Right, which I mean, I guess that I guess, I guess that's one of my issues here with like the CHP policy. Um, there's a, a, an example and I haven't heard yet a really compelling argument beyond maybe they just, they operate on different, on a different radio. I, I don't know the tech, the, the technical piece of this, that that may be the one reason why they can do it and, and we can't. So I guess I just, I'm open to the, the study session idea. I just want to make sure that then we really get to have a deep dive into this and that that preparation is going to be done. Um, ahead, you know, and that preparation will be, will be there for us to have a better understanding of it. Chair, can I just add one thing just to follow up? Uh, to follow up on um, please, um, Ms. Stump's comment, if I gave the impression that the police department hasn't done its research, then that was not the impression that I want to give. You know, unfortunately, our TSD director, Captain April Wagner, has done extensive research, and uh, we were hoping that she could be here tonight, but unfortunately, she's out of state on a pre-planned um, vacation. And so I'm very confident, and I would welcome the opportunity uh, to get with council and show what the police department's done um, and what research we've done and what um, steps we've taken to communicate and, and keep our community um, abreast of what's happening. We welcome that, that, that type of discussion. So if I came across that we didn't know what other people were doing, that, that was not the message that I was trying to send and I apologize. No, and I don't think you you gave. I mean, I guess more on more on the CHP piece, and and maybe a not being clear clear enough on 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 whether that would apply to Palo Alto or or not. I, that that seems to be. I guess what I'm trying to, it, that that seems to be an open question still. So and I would I'd like to I would, get that answer for whatever if it's a study session or an action item. I think I think we need to have a clear understanding of what that answer is. Yeah, and I think that you know. I think it's appropriate for the subject matter expert that's dealing with that issue within the police department who's really informed um, and who can provide those type of you know, um, discussion points on the research that's been done and what's feasible and what works in Palo Alto to, to be able to come to the table. Unfortunately, I, you know, I can't provide that to you tonight because I just don't have that, I don't have that level of information, but I know that there's people in the building and, and we have done that work. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, agreed, and not not expecting you to have that that answer right now. That I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say is, for item D, I'm open to the study session a, as long as as long as we make it clear in there that we are expecting as as, as close of an answer as we can get on that issue. Okay, so, so Council Monica. Member Tanaka, are you willing to accept that as a friendly amendment? Sure. Okay, and maybe we'll just um, 
and let's just say, and how best to allow the public and the media to be rapidly informed, sorry, in the middle there, right before allow. Okay. All right, that, um, that concludes, uh, <laughs> that concludes my edits on the motion. <laughs> Great. Thank, th thanks, Councilman McCormack. Sorry. So on. So back to to D. Does staff feel then that I mean, is as this converse is this conversation sufficient to to make it clear on the on the CHP piece, or do we need to explicitly include that in the motion that we expect basically an analysis and an answer at that at that study session on that issue? We can be prepared to discuss what the chp is doing we'll have that expectation and i guess to the to the city attorney's office so then would we be able to have a, a legal analysis of that of what they're doing and and if that could apply to palo alto sure sure the legal issues are relatively straightforward and and um we're, we're happy to help with those um the, the the only thing about a study session is that um, of course, what can come out of that is um, just a, a general direction to come back with some item if there's additional action to be taken. But but often there isn't. Often it's a more of a work in progress, or you know. So it, I think I think it's a great first step here because yeah, it, it's a complicated issue and there's a lot of pieces. And I do think that kind of setting the table with both the facts and the law, um, you know, could be. Um, helpful for everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think this is a good first step. I think resolving the ambiguity here will be able to inform us on our on our next move. Council Member Corman. Um, the city manager has appeared and I realized that indeed we probably should say request the city manager and mayor schedule just because I believe that's how it's done. So I apologize. Not sure that if that's why he appeared, but it occurred to me that it looked a little odd. So that works for me, Councilmember Tanaka. Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Okay, and welcome, City Manager. Okay, anything, uh, anything else? Anybody? What? Any other questions, thoughts, or amendments? Okay, seeing none. If the clerk can call the vote. Chair Stone. Yes. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody. That was a so, good discussion. Sorry for a moment, Mr. Chair. Um, I think even though this was unanimous, this is not the kind of thing, what you've ended up with here is not the kind of thing that goes on consent. What we can put on consent is a discrete action. Um, so the referral to the HRC could go on, on consent. Um, I think C and D actually, you know, might, they're, they're, yeah. Um, since the city manager is here, uh, Mr. City Manager, do you have thoughts about whether this can go on consent and just, you know, proceed without further counsel? I would agree that uh, having some council discussion, and obviously it's uh, at the discretion of the committee, but would agree that having some council discussion of this would be appropriate. In fact, even with A, suspect that the HRC might like to understand, again, as has somewhat been described here, but uh, with the benefit of the full council, uh, what's being asked of them. So I uh, would suggest that all of these be uh, or this be agendized as an action item. I think, quite frankly, D will be discussed whether on consent or not. So, um, might as well shortcut a step and get it scheduled appropriate. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Now moving on to that finishes our action items. So now moving on to future meetings and agendas. Yes, so we will be hearing from the city council sometime soon uh, on the work plan, which we have your tentative calendar 
uh, right now we are just kind of going forward with uh, how we've organized it until we hear more about council referrals or any uh, suggested feedback. So for the month of March, it is a lot of audit items. So just so you're all mentally preparing, uh, the city auditor, I believe, has three reports he'll be bringing to you. Um, I did want to bring up in this forum just to make sure that we're clear. Last year, there was a question of whether this committee will start at six or seven. And I think there was interest last year in sticking with seven o'clock, but I wanted to bring that up here for the committee. So if there's interest in something else that we can just be clear and plan for that going forward. I'm, I have no preference. Council member Tanaka, I know your schedule is a little, is pretty, are you, are you available at six? It's really tough. I really prefer seven if possible. Seven's fine with me. Council member Cormac? Fine with me. Um, we moved fine staff. That was, a, um, certainly do that. Um, that's if that's preferable. Sorry, you, you cut out your, I heard like every other word. So oh, seven okay. Is okay. yeah, maybe that's because I don't have that fiber yet. We were talking about with UAC. Anyway, um, last year on finance, we moved it to six o'clock. That was a request from the staff who found it more conducive um, to their, um, their own work um, and family schedules. I am happy to do that if that works. I'm also happy to have it be at seven if, if that's the will of um, the chair and uh, in the committee and uh, Ms. Cotton Gaines. Okay. And, and staff, any strong, strong preferences? Not really, no. Whatever works where you'll have quorum, I can do your work. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well then, yes, then let's, let's stick with, let's stick with seven o'clock. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, having that dialogue so I can make sure we oblige going forward. Absolutely. Okay, that's it for me. All right, wonderful. Well, then that uh, that concludes our first meeting of the year. Really great discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, staff, and thanks to the public for for tuning in and weighing in. Um, looking forward to a, a good productive year with everybody. Good night. We're adjourned. <laughs>